Built of stone and adobe, Fort Davis stands as a silent but vivid sentinel to a bygone era when frontier posts were the cutting edge of westward expansion. Fort Davis symbolizes a bastion of U.S. military presence in West Texas, spanning five decades, from 1854 to 1891. Troops deployed here provided protection for overland immigrant travel and merchant caravans, performed scientific surveys, and served as a deterrent to the tragic struggle of a proud and independent people fighting to retain their culture and lifestyle. Long before the arrival of Spaniards to West Texas, the area was already frequented by American Indians. When the conquistadors first explored the region in the 1500s, they found evidence of prehistoric peoples in the form of pictographs and petroglyphs. They made contact with contemporary American Indians, who were mostly sedentary, living in towns along the great rivers of the southwest. They also came in contact with more nomadic tribes dwelling in the mountains or residing on the plains. The first European to pass through the Davis Mountains was Antonio de Espejo, whose cavalcade entered Olympia Canyon on August 13, 1583. Other entradas sporadically visited West Texas, but the Comanches, and especially the Apaches, both Mescalero and Lipan, bitterly contested the Spanish penetrations into their territory. Not until after the Mexican-American War, however, when the region officially became part of the United States, did large-scale expeditions explore the vast, empty, parched deserts of West Texas. The discovery of gold in California in 1848 accelerated federal interest in a direct overland route. Just one year after the strikes, more than 3,000 travelers braved the desert extremes, lack of water, and collision with Indians in quest of the yellow metal. In 1849, a U.S. military force under Lieutenants William Whiting and William F. Smith pioneered a route which entered the Davis Mountains from the east. Whiting's party followed a sparkling, clear, winding stream, which they named Limpia, to a stand of tall cottonwoods marked with pictographs. Whiting named the setting Painted Comanche Camp. The government, under increasing pressure from the public to provide safe passage and maintain the newly opened San Antonio-El Paso Road, constructed a line of forts. One of the sites selected was situated near Painted Comanche Camp. The Davis Mountain outpost was ideal. It straddled the main east-west artery, possessed abundant water, grass, and wood, and lay in close proximity to the Comanche War Trail, which the warriors used to invade or return with plunder from Mexican villages. In 1854, six companies of the 8th Infantry, under Lieutenant Colonel Washington Sewell, established Fort Davis. Named in honor of Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War, the post was constructed near the mouth of a box canyon below rocky outcroppings near Olympia Creek. Sewell disliked the site, complaining that its location, placed below the base of the rocks, provided the Indians with protection from discovery. Second Lieutenant Zenas R. Bliss echoed the words of his commanding officer, declaring, the situation of the post, though beautiful, was a very bad one. There was hardly a chimney in the post that an Indian could not have thrown a stone into from the bluff, and a comparatively small party could have made the post untenable. But orders were orders, and Sewell followed them without hesitation. Within a short period of time, a shoddy collection of 60 assorted wooden structures punctuated the rocky landscape below the canyon rim. The troops utilized local building materials. The first structures consisted of little more than oak and cottonwood slabs nailed against a crude frame. A mixture of mud and grass filled in the spacing between the boards, while the roofs consisted of canvas or thatch. Humble though comfortable is how Lieutenant Edward Hartz described the quarters. A less generous enlisted man's appraisal declared simply, Fort Davis is a poorly built fort. Eventually, some of the temporary shelters yielded to stone buildings, and the fort assumed the appearance of a permanent facility. Despite the Spartan living conditions afforded soldiers, the post earned a reputation as one of the more favorable assignments on the western frontier. Fort Davis is the most delightful climate of any place I have ever seen in the south, and the winters are not very cold, though they have snow and the storms are sometimes severe. The cattle and sheep live throughout the winter without shelter of any kind, and seldom or never suffer from the cold, wrote Lieutenant Bliss. For the Plains tribes and Mountain Apaches, the westward procession of travelers and now permanent military posts along Indian migratory trails accelerated already deteriorating relations between the cultures. From the perspective of the Indians, the Europeans were trespassers on what was perceived as tribal lands. 
In a series of grueling but usually bloodless clashes, the Southwest from Arizona to the lower Rio Grande corridor embraced war during the late 1850s. Sewell spent nearly seven years as Fort Davis's commander. His men of the 8th Infantry, afoot or mounted on mules, occupied much of their time in the arduous but unspectacular duty of escorting mail and freight trains, pursuing but rarely catching raiders who had attacked travelers or a mail station, and covering their sector with patrols that seldom came to grips with Apaches or Comanches. Truth strength at Fort Davis fluctuated, but on average, not more than 300 men were available to defend the Texas frontier. For the first few years, Fort Davis stood as the only frontline frontier military defense guarding the San Antonio El Paso Road between Fort Clark and Fort Bliss, a trek of 500 miles of trackless desert expanse. Protection of the San Antonio El Paso Mail Service remained one of the most important assignments for the Davis Mountain Garrison. A situation magnified in 1859 when the Butterfield Overland Mail shifted operations from the Guadalupe Mountains route, known as the Upper Road, to the Lower Road, which came through Wild Rose Pass and Fort Davis. Depending on availability of water, mail and change of livestock stations were established about 15 miles apart. Soldiers helped guard the stations. The road from Berea Springs, 28 miles east of Fort Davis, twisted its way through the Davis Mountains and Wild Rose Pass, a favorite Apache ambush site. Olympia Station near Fort Davis offered mail drivers and passengers temporary relief before the westward journey resumed. Barrel Springs lay 18 miles west of Fort Davis. Then it was 19 more treacherous miles to the next stop at El Muerto, or Dead Man's Hole. 32 more miles took the dusty travelers to Van Horn Wells, then 20 more to reach the Eagle Springs Stay Station, another popular spot for surprise Indian attacks. The next stop on the San Antonio El Paso Road was Fort Quitman, noted 32 miles west and hugging the bank of the muddy Rio Grande. Once coaches passed Fort Quitman, the remaining 85 miles to Fort Bliss were usually uneventful. In the mid to late 1850s, Forts Lancaster, Hudson, Quitman, and Stockton came online and greatly assisted the Fort Davis garrison in patrolling West Texas. Pre-Civil War Fort Davis also played host to several military camel caravans, a pet project of Jefferson Davis, the former Secretary of War. Davis believed the hardy camel to be the government's solution to pack animals in the arid southwest. The experiment seemed successful, however the concept was quickly forgotten in the face of another more urgent crisis. In 1861, with storm clouds brewing in the east, Fort Davis became a casualty of the American Civil War. Texas seceded from the Union and the federal government initiated a process to consolidate its far-flung western army to more friendly locations. Union forces evacuated Fort Davis in April. One company of the 2nd Texas Mounted Rifles, following in the wake of the departing Federals, reoccupied the post. Confederate Texans soon discovered their primary adversary was not the Bluecoats, but the Apaches who harassed the garrison at every available opportunity. One such chance occurred in August 1861. Mescalero Apaches under Nicholas ran off with the post's livestock. An inexperienced lieutenant, Reuben Mays, leading a party of only 13 men, tracked the Apaches into the Big Bend country where he and his men were ambushed. Every man perished except a Mexican guide. In late 1861, Fort Davis hosted Confederate Brigadier General Henry Hopkins Sibley's Army of New Mexico. Sibley's 3,000-man column staggered into Fort Davis en route to the invasion and capture of New Mexico for the Confederacy. Six months later, after Sibley's campaign fizzled outside of Santa Fe at the Battle of Glorieta Pass, the Fort Davis contingent watched a gloomy procession of Texans plodding eastward toward San Antonio. The Confederates abandoned the mountain outposts. A Union scouting party, following behind Sibley's troops, visited the deserted post but did not linger. Fort Davis remained abandoned until two years after the closure of the Civil War. Then, in 1867, Lieutenant Colonel Wesley Merritt, a young and energetic cavalry officer, protege of Major General Philip H. Sheridan, returned to Olympia Creek to rebuild Fort Davis nearly on top of the ruins of the first fort. Merritt's command consisted of four companies of the newly formed 9th Cavalry, one of the two all-black cavalry regiments created after the Civil War. Under Merritt's supervision, 2nd Fort Davis quickly took shape. Stone and adobe buildings with wood-shingled roofs replaced the dilapidated structure of the first fort. 
Construction was a continual and evolving process. By the mid-1880s, when the fort peaked, more than 50 structures punctuated the landscape. Life at Fort Davis for the enlisted ranks was normally tedious and dull. Actual campaigns against marauding Indians or preserving the peace in an area virtually void of law enforcement consumed little of their time. Typical post duties consisted of constant marching and drilling, working on fatigue details such as drawing water from nearby Olympia Creek, building and repairing telegraph lines and roads, cutting and hauling timber from the pineries in the Davis Mountains for use in construction or building. Soldiers oftentimes were employed or detailed to the post quartermaster and commissary departments, where the enlisted men managed the garrison's inventory of supplies and food, a critical component in the efficient operation of an army fort. When not on duty, the troops created their own diversions, reading from a well-stocked post library, band music, theatricals, hops, and sporting activities such as baseball and bicycling became commonplace in the 1880s. Off-post amusements, mainly gambling, drinking, and prostitution, took place in the shadow of the post in the village of Chihuahua. <laughs> Meanwhile, the growing village of Fort Davis developed in the post-Civil War decades. Longtime local merchants like Daniel Murphy and rancher Diedrich Dutchover prospered while doing business that catered to the military garrison. Other enterprises, such as the Charles Siebenborn and Joseph Sender Mercantile and the Otis Kesey store, emerged to support a growing civilian population. A decade later, the census for Fort Davis approached 800, of which nearly two-thirds of the residents were of Hispanic origin. In 1884, Fort Davis featured a drugstore, lumberyard, clock shop, a dressmaker, bakery, butcher, stable, dairy, and liquor store. In addition, several saloons, grocery stores, hotels, and seven dry goods general merchandise stores bedecked the streets of Fort Davis. Because of the garrisoning of African-American troops at Fort Davis, a perpetual fixture from 1867 to 1885, racial discrimination remained prevalent to one degree or another. Commanded by white officers, the black companies endured racial slurs from their white counterparts. One visitor to the post wrote, It was evident that the officers perhaps from old prejudices of slavery times, believed in the management of the colored troops with strict dignity and icy distance. Orders and intercourse between them simply went on in the manner of cold machinery. Still worse, civilian treatment of the black soldiers was at times inhumane. They were oftentimes denied food, lodging, or access to public transportation, despite performing duties beneficial to the civilian population. Racial disharmony reached its zenith in 1880 when the first African American to graduate from West Point, Henry O. Flipper, transferred to Fort Davis. In charge of the post commissary, Flipper was accused of embezzling government funds. Found not guilty of the embezzlement charges, Flipper was convicted of lesser charges of conduct unbecoming an officer and dismissed from the Army. And the court thereby does sentence you, Second Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper of the 10th Regiment of the United States Cavalry, to be dismissed from the service of the United States. Flipper's dismissal may have been racially motivated. Unsuccessful in winning reinstatement in the Army, Flipper entered the private sector where he made a name for himself as a civil engineer. In 1976, Flipper's descendants interceded in his behalf and urged the Army to review the court martial transcripts. The military agreed that the punishment of dismissal was too excessive. 
Flipper's files were upgraded and he posthumously received an honorable discharge. Despite Fort Davis's strategic location, lethal combat with the Indians remained the exception rather than the rule. Most instances of conflict was a result of raiding parties focused on stealing livestock from the post herds or civilian ranches. Fort Davis soldiers lot thousands of miles in searing summer heat with temperatures often beyond 100 degrees or braved wintry blasts sweeping across the southern plains. Soldiers subsisted off bland diets consisting largely of little more than salt pork or salt beef, hardtack, coffee, and all for $13 a month. While life on the frontier post was normally mundane, soldiers sometimes found themselves in the center of major military operations. Following the establishment of 2nd Fort Davis, troops were closely involved in several campaigns against the Mescalero and Warm Springs Apaches. The Mescaleros, despite acceptance of a government reservation in South Mexico in 1855, continued their time-honored tradition of raiding West Texas. For nearly 30 years, the Mescalero Apaches and the Davis Mountain Garrison engaged in a deadly game of cat and mouse. Regulars of the 9th Cavalry, occupants of Fort Davis from 1867 to 1875, many of them former slaves from Louisiana and Kentucky, courted themselves well in the confrontations with the proud Apaches. On September 14, 1868, Lieutenant Patrick Cusack, commanding 60 troopers of the 9th Cavalry and a volunteer party of Mexican scouts, attacked and destroyed an Apache encampment in the Horsehead Hills in the Big Bend region. The surprise assault resulted in the death of 20 to 30 warriors, the recapture of stolen livestock from Fort Stockton and Lancaster, and the rescue and release of two Mexican youths abandoned by the Indians. Two years later, in January 1870, more than 200 Ninth Cavalry troopers, commanded by Captain Francis Dodge, struck a Mescalero village, this time at the head of Delaware Creek in the foothills of the Guadalupe Mountains. Dodge's buffalo soldiers routed the warriors, killing 10 and destroying much of their winter supplies. Continued problems with the Mescalero forced the scattered deployment of soldiers to other satellite installations. These subposts or camps were tethered to Fort Davis, the mother post. Small-scale cavalry and infantry units periodically occupied these camps at strategic watering places such as Barrel Springs, El Muerto, Vieja Pass, Van Horn Wells, Eagle Spring, and Old Fort Quitman. Subposts were established north of the post, one about 25 miles away from Seven Springs, and one at Pine Springs nearly 150 miles north in the Guadalupe Mountains. Sixty miles to the southeast, Camp Pena, Colorado, emerged to help protect the Upper Big Bend region. Troops at the subposts, mail stations, or camps performed scouting and reconnaissance missions besides protecting travel along the roads. They extensively mapped a largely uninhabited region, taking great care to record the location of good grazing lands and water holes. Troops stationed at the subposts were usually rotated after a month-long tour of duty. Military actions were not limited, however, to patrols or occasional confrontations with Indians. Because of the proximity of the Davis garrison to the Mexican border, less than 90 miles away, troops from Fort Davis were summoned from time to time to deal with disturbances of international consequences. In one instance, in December of 1876, Colonel George Andrews, commanding, accompanied black foot soldiers from the 25th Infantry and one three-inch ordnance rifle manned by troopers of the all-black 10th Cavalry to Presidio del Norte, to protect American business interests on both sides of the border and to force the release of an American hostage being detained in the Mexican border town of Ojinaga. When Mexican authorities rejected Andrews' demands for the release of the hostage, Andrews ordered a few shells fired across the river into the community of Ojinaga. The shelling produced the desired effects and the captive was released. Fort Davis's most significant association with the Indian Wars came in the late 1870s involving a band of Warm Springs Apaches. Victorio, war leader of the Warm Springs Apaches, whose ancestral home lay in southwest New Mexico, refused to submit to reservation confinement and exile in Arizona territory. For two years, Victorio slipped the military snares prepared for him in New Mexico. By the spring of 1880, Victorio's small force, which did not exceed 150 warriors, took refuge in northern Chihuahua, Mexico. Faced with dwindling supplies of ammunition and hounded by U.S. and Mexican patrols, Victorio's warriors, including a few Mescaleros, allied with the Warm Springs Apaches, collided with travelers in Bass Canyon near Eagle Spring in mid-May. 
The surprise assault struck the Graham party, which included newlyweds Maggie and Harry Graham. Mrs. Graham and another person in the traveling caravan, James Grant, were killed. Emigrant Daniel Murphy and Mrs. Graham's husband, Harry, were wounded but survived. Soldiers summoned from Fort Davis searched the area but could not locate the attackers. Apache depredations intensified. In June, warriors hit a detachment of Pueblo Indian scouts from El Paso under Lieutenant Frank Mills in the Vieja Mountains near Vieja Pass. Killed in the attack was scout and Pueblo chief Simon Olgan. The increased Apache presence in the Trans-Pecos prompted Colonel Benjamin Grierson to shift additional soldiers into West Texas. Colonel Grierson was commander of the District of the Pecos, headquartered at Fort Concho. Grierson's forces consisted chiefly of the U.S. 10th Cavalry, many of them based at Fort Davis. The cavalrymen clashed with Victoria's battle-tested warriors first in July 1880 at Tinaja de los Palmas, and then in August at Rattlesnake Springs. At Tinaja de las Palmas, near the eastern entrance to Quitman Canyon, Grierson, with a detachment of eight men, including his son Robert, fortified themselves high in the rocks above the only waterhole present for miles. Realizing that he controlled the all-important water source, Grierson now waited for the Apaches to come to him. After dawn on the 30th, a diminutive force of six black soldiers, two white officers, and one white civilian were reinforced by 60 more blue-coated troopers. Together, they blocked Victorio's advancements of warriors, estimated at 150, until relief columns approached. A week later, at Rattlesnake Springs, Grierson's same tactics to outdistance Victorio and control the water sources and then hold them against the onslaught of warriors succeeded. Each time, the Buffalo soldiers proved their merit in battle, both to the Apaches and to their white officers. Although Victoria was not decisively defeated in either engagement, the soldiers retained control of the water holes, and without water, Victoria faced little choice but to retreat across the Rio Grande. Before recrossing the river, warriors attacked the eastbound stage near Quitman Canyon. Killed was former Union Brigadier General James Byrne, now an employee of the Texas and Pacific Railroad. Worn down by relentless military pursuits and lacking adequate food and ammunition, the Apaches were cornered by a Mexican army in northern Chihuahua in October 1880 at Tres Castillos. Victorio and most of his followers were slaughtered in a one-sided affair. Victoria's warriors, however, did not leave West Texas quietly. In one final parting shot, a group of 35 to 50 survivors of the Tres Castillos debacle surprised a picket line of 12 men near Ojo Caliente. When the smoke and dust settled, seven troopers of the 10th Cavalry lay dead or missing in what constituted as one of the last skirmishes waged between Apaches and soldiers on Texas soil. Much of the credit for driving Victoria out of Texas belongs to the soldiers of the 10th Cavalry and their mild-mannered colonel, Benjamin Grierson. Capable and underrated, the former music teacher and Civil War hero never enjoyed close relations with his superiors. Grierson's career was hampered by petty jealousies, his affiliation with an all-black regiment, prejudices centering on his lack of West Point training, and, to what appeared to some of his critics, an overly sympathetic attitude toward Native Americans. During the Victorio campaign, Grierson found Fort Davis to his liking. He transferred regimental headquarters to the Mountain Post in 1882. Troop strength reached an all-time high in 1884 when more than 600 enlisted men called the Mountain Post home. Under Grierson's direction, Fort Davis enjoyed its last major building program. A new commissary and quartermaster storehouses, remodeling of the cavalry barracks, additional officers' quarters, two enlisted men's barracks, and a wing to the hospital were added. New construction at the Post also included the latest technological advancement, a new water system was installed. Later, after Grierson's departure, an ice house was built, one of the first in West Texas. But only a few years later, the outpost on Olympia Creek became obsolete and its remaining years were placid. Brigadier General David Stanley remarked, Fort Davis had outlived its usefulness as a military station, a reference to its isolated location so remote from railroad supply lines and the termination of the Indian Wars. On June 30th, 1891, Fort Davis was officially abandoned. The forts reverted back to its private owner who rented some of the buildings as residences. Most structures, however, fell into a state of disrepair or were salvaged for use by locals. In 1961, Congress authorized Fort Davis National Historic Site as a unit of the National Park Service. 
Today, Fort Davis is fittingly preserved as a lasting memorial to the U.S. soldiers who served their country faithfully for nearly half a century. Officers like the affable and competent Benjamin Grierson of the 10th Cavalry, or the corpulent, gruff-speaking colonel of the 1st Infantry, William Pecos Bill Shafter, who served efficiently in the Indian Wars and later during the Spanish-American War, or the talented artist Captain Arthur Tracy Lee, whose sketches provide us with the only visual images of the 1st Fort Davis, or Lieutenant Zenas Bliss, whose military career combined stints at both 1st and 2nd Fort Davis, and the enlisted men who endured low pay, long hours, and bad food. Some, like Charles Mulhern, ordnance sergeant at Fort Davis, retired in the community, became a bank president and successful rancher. Or Thomas Forsyth, longtime commissary sergeant at the post. Or Anton Agerman, who served at Fort Davis until 1890, then in retirement returned to live in the Fort Davis community until his death in 1954. And George Bentley, member of the 9th Cavalry, who served at Fort Davis in the 1860s and who later made his home in the community of Fort Davis. But the story of Fort Davis is more than just the officers and the enlisted ranks. The history of Fort Davis National Historic Site includes hundreds of untold accounts represented by the civilian personnel, masons, carpenters, wheelwrights, and laborers who worked on post, or the stories of the army dependents such as the wives, children, servants, and laundresses who followed the soldiers to the frontier and whose contributions to the settlement of the West should not be forgotten. But the old fort can also be viewed as a symbol of the tragic conflict that engaged North America's original inhabitants against the unrelenting wave of other Americans. In the final analysis, the blue-coated soldiers of Fort Davis, black and white, forge an indelible and stirring chapter in American history. Their story should not be diminished in view of a later generation's assessment of wrongs waged upon the American Indians. The military played a significant role in the Western expansion of the United States. For nearly 40 years, the Army's presence at Fort Davis aided in the protection, settlement, and economic development of West Texas and the Southwest.